Uh, so Natalie has a, a long history uh, with distributed systems uh, at Oracle and Google. And for like the last almost three years, you've been a partner at Ampl or, uh, a principal at Amplify Partners. Uh, she's invested in Tiger Beetle and uh, Ready Set, two uh, really cool database companies. Um, and I, I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, at Systems Distributed uh, in February. Um, I'll be honest, Natalie, uh, I was kind of in like the like VC bad camp. Um, and so, you know, when I got to see her uh, present this, this talk, uh, I was like, okay, like I was maybe being a little narrow sighted. There's a lot more nuance. Um, and so when I was uh, putting this event together, Natalie, uh, when, when I saw her submission, I'm like, this is like the perfect uh, topic to, to throw in here, um, just to have a bit of like uh, breadth of ideas. So uh, I'm really excited for all of you to, to get to see this talk, um, put it together for Natalie. Oh, wow, when the lights go up, I can't see you all anymore. <laughs> um, hey, everyone, my name is Natalie Vase. Um, I'm an investor at Amplify Partners, which is an early stage venture firm based in the Bay Area. Um, as Matt alluded to, I have a history of working in databases and distributed systems for a very long time before I made my way to the dark side, i.e. investing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm here to talk to you about that. I know this is uh, going to be different than some of the talks that you heard yesterday and today that are very technical and programming focused, but I hope I can also weave uh, in some lessons that I've had from moving from the systems and product side onto the investing side. Let me just make sure the clicker works. Where should it point? IT, can you help me? It's <laughs> the white clicker, the one with the black clicker. Oh, where, where should I go, over here? Right. Ah, okay, I will be coming over here to click. Um, so for the presentation today, I'm gonna walk a little bit through my background and what my path was to the investing side. Uh, I'm gonna share a little bit more about like what is venture capital, what is VC. Um, it can be a very opaque system, even though many of us have worked at startups, uh, which have frequently taken venture funding. I wanna show you kind of behind the curtains what happens, how we make de decisions, um, how the world of venture capital works. Uh, then I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how Amplify Partner works, which is the fund that I work at. I'm going to walk you through how we think about investing in software, software that you can love, uh, and more specifically, how we've uh, had a history of investing in academic projects that have turned into companies as well as open source uh, projects that have turned into businesses. So a bit more about my background. Um, again, Matt gave me a great introduction, but I grew up in the Bay Area, um, so I spent most of my life there. I've moved here or there. I've also, uh, I went to high school in Italy. Where's Loris? My Italian is terrible, but we've tried this before over dinner. Um, I also lived in Switzerland for a period of time when I was at Google. Um, but at a high level, I started as a systems engineer, moved to product, and then eventually made my way to investing. So I've sort of gone up the stack uh, and closer to the business side over time. But the common thread for me, um, I've always worked in databases and distributed systems. Um, I love databases. I kind of feel like they're the beating heart of a business. That's why I've always been attracted to them, either working on them or investing in them. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about like why I love databases and also how um, I've come to invest in really cool database systems like Tiger Beetle. Uh, I also should mention, yes, I've worked at some big companies, but I've also worked at a startup called Interana, which you see up here, um, which probably no one has heard of. It was the most fun I've ever had in my career was working at a startup. And that was part of the attraction that I had going back to the startup ecosystem on the investing side um, was also seeing the mishaps that can happen uh, at companies that are trying to scale. Um, this startup did not have a good ending. Um, we uh, took the company from, you know, very small to about 100 people. It was eventually uh, acquired into Twitter, really just to find it a home. Um, but what I learned too is how really good technology doesn't always turn into a good product and therefore also a good business. Um, and uh, you know, I had a lot of good lessons from that time there. It was still like one of the most fun experiences I've ever had. Um, and it's also the name up here that no one recognizes. Uh, so what is VC? Um, we're not talking about video conferencing uh, or voice channels, which I know is a Discord term. Um, VC stands for venture capital. 
Uh, venture capital in a very precise dictionary definition uh, is money that is invested in a project in which there's substantial element of risk, typically for a new or expanding business. How many people in this room have worked at a venture-backed startup? Okay, decent number of people. Uh, every company I've worked at has been venture-backed. Oracle, Google, even in Toronto, the startup that I mentioned. Um, so even if you're not familiar with how venture capital works, it's sort of this force that's interesting to learn about because it's one way that businesses can be built. It is not the only way. It is not the only winning way. It's also a way to lose. Um, how is venture capital different from a loan? So I wanted to put this slide up here. It was inspired by a question that Andrew Kelly posed during my last talk. He was like, why would you take venture capital? Why not just take a loan? So let's compare it um, to kind of a more well understood financial method of raising money. Um, if you're going to start a business, um, you're going to sometimes need money, um, which is frequently used to actually hire people. Um, obviously, you can bootstrap a business, but if you want to scale it at some point, you're going to have to look for a source of capital. Um, venture capital, in the way that we understand it today, is actually a fairly new concept, this idea of exchanging um, money for equity. Uh, this concept, came about in the 50s, so it's really only like a 60-year-old concept um, that in many ways has transformed the way businesses are done and how they grow. Um, but in essence, um, venture capital is a method to raise money by exchanging a portion of your business in the form of equity. A loan, um, on the other hand, is where you raise money with the expectation of paying that money back over time. This is typically tied to things like interest rates. Um, you usually aren't exchanging a portion of equity um, for the company. Uh, and usually loans are not available for high risk businesses. Um, venture capital actually started as a way to fund really capital intensive research because people couldn't actually get loans um, for their businesses that they wanted to start. Um, so they're pretty different um, and like at a high level venture capital is called equity financing and loans or venture debt is called debt financing. They're kind of two different ways that you can raise money to build a business. One where you're giving up a portion of your business for investors that are giving you money and one where you're taking on a loan that you pay back over time with a principal. Um, so there are two very different ways to raise money. Um, one, venture capital allows you to kind of have higher risk, higher reward. Um, you never have to pay back venture capital. Um, that's sort of like the beauty of it for entrepreneurs. You don't have to put up collateral. Um, if you're taking a loan uh, and you default on that loan, you might have to put up collateral like personal assets or your house to pay it back. Um, so kind of one of the, beauty, the beautiful things of venture capital for startups and for people that want to start companies is lowering the risk for people to start, uh, start companies. Um, to illustrate this another way, in the past 15 years, here's a graph demonstrating the amount of venture capital that's gone into the industry um, over time, including the number of deals. So you can see that this is becoming a more common way um, for people to raise money for businesses. Um, you can obviously see too, 2021 was a huge outlier. Uh, and I think we will over time begin to see how there's some sort of correction to what happened, um, which was this huge influx of venture capital into startups that uh, maybe shouldn't have been funded, might not actually be viable, um, but we'll have to have some sort of reckoning down the line. Uh, more than half of businesses in the US are now venture funded. So it's unsurprising that many of you put your hand up, um, whether or not you you know, whether or not you're super involved with the venture process, um, like if you're a founder, you're going to be more involved and more close to that uh, system, whether or not you're close to it, it's probably um, a way that many of the companies that you have worked at or will work at in the future um, have been funded. So it's a good thing to understand. Um, I think to Laura's point, um, it's really easy to kind of be narrow in the domain that you're looking at, but understanding the ecosystem will well equip you um, to build a business, whether you choose to take venture capital funding or not. Uh, so I also wanted to outline a little bit more about where the money comes from in venture capital. This to me was actually the thing I knew the least about until I joined. Um, venture capital funds actually have to get their money from somewhere too. So in a way, we're actually intermediaries between other investors and startups. Um, so venture funds raise money from what are called limited partners. 
and limited partners are other investors that usually are sitting on large amounts of capital that they want to deploy over a long period of time. These tend to be things like pension funds, nonprofits, insurance companies, family offices, university endowments, foundations. Um, a question, if I were an entrepreneur raising money from a VC firm, something I would ask is who are your LPs? Um, ultimately, you kind of want to know where your investors are getting their money from because 80% of the profits that uh, venture funds get go back to the limited partners. So this is kind of a uh, part of the system I didn't understand well until I was actually in venture capital. We ourselves actually raise money from other investors as well. So uh, yes, people pitch us for, for uh, you know, company ideas to invest in, we also pitch LPs uh, to invest in us so that we can deploy the capital. Um, so VCs raise funds. These funds are deployed in a bunch of startups. Uh, these startups become what's called your portfolio. And your portfolio is any number of startups that meet the criteria or mission of your investing firm. Um, in the case of Amplify, we're an early stage fund, so we come in really early uh, and we invest in technical tools and platforms. In that portfolio of you know, 12 to 20 companies, some will do well, some won't. This model is what allows venture capitalists to take on high risk bets where many companies go to zero, but some do well. And again, this is why people don't expect you to pay back venture capital um, because there's ways that we protect the downside for ourselves by building a portfolio. Um, the other thing to note about portfolios and venture capital is dictated by something called the power law. There's actually a really good book about this. If you want to learn more about venture capital and the business and how um, you know, this works, it's actually called the power law. Um, and uh, this, the power law says that the best investments are worth exponentially more than the good or great investments. So in any portfolio of 15 to 20 companies, you might have two that end up succeeding to become good, sustained, enduring businesses, and the others will do okay or perhaps have to shut down over time. And that's kind of part of the, the risk of investing in these startups that really have no profit and sometimes no business plans, but sometimes great teams and great ideas. Uh, I was at such a company that ended up folding and was one of the zeros on the balance book for the investors, but it was really fun. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about investing in systems that Amplify specifically and how Amplify works. Um, so there's a lot of different types of venture funds out there. Um, there's early stage funds that come in really early when you're sort of at the inception of your project. There's later stage funds, which are often deploying really, really big checks. And we call that growth investing, um, where they're really looking at kind of the efficiency of your business and the revenue numbers. At the earliest stage, Frequently you have an idea or a project or a technology, but you certainly don't have revenue. And so what we tend to evaluate at the earliest stage is sort of like the market and the team and the technical expertise and depth uh, that the team has. And uh, you know we are specialized. Um, there's generalist funds that look at things from consumer to enterprise. Uh, Amplify specifically is domain focused. Um, so we back technical founders that are building uh, in infrastructure, distributed systems, developer tools, or AIML. Um, we make our first investments at the seed or series A. Um, I really like early stage because I think you get to evaluate the technology and it's not so much about business efficiency, although that becomes very important later on. Um, my background as a technologist lent itself much better um, to working at the early stage of investing. Um, I think growth stage is very interesting. I just don't think that uh, I would actually have the best background for that. Uh, the other thing that's fun about early stage is that you have the longest term view. Uh, when you're starting to work with a company at the earliest phases, you're usually looking at that on a 10 year time horizon. Um, so one thing that stood out um, from some of the earlier talks today was like this trade off that you frequently have to make between like short term gains and long term gains. I think unfortunately, um, it's very short-sighted to make those trade-offs for a business um, where you're making a bad you know, user 
you're making a decision that's bad for the user. I actually think it has a bad long-term effect on the company. But I think when you're getting into situations with short-term views, um, those are actually going to be bad long-term decisions for the company. So ultimately, I do think having a long-term view is better for everyone. Um, but I do understand that taking venture capital and being in business um, will sometimes make you uh, take sort of poor trade-offs. Um, here's a sample of some of the cool companies that we get to work with every day. Um, there's a couple that I know that are in the room here, Sourcegraph, CMD, Tiger Beetle. Um, the categories that I have up here, developer tools, machine learning, data analytics, these are categorized really by the, the user that they target, the user persona. So developer tools and infra are tools that are you know, targeted towards developers. Um, machine learning and AI is really targeted towards like the data scientist and data and analytics products are targeted towards product managers and data science or data analysts. Um, so what are, the, uh, what are some of the things that we look for uh, when we're evaluating investments? We typically look across three different vectors. Um, the first is market. Um, sometimes a market is already defined or very well understood. For example, like the database market, um, there's sort of a precedent for how big this is, um, how many companies there are, how much people spend, or what the need is or acute pain point that product is solving. Sometimes you're creating a new market, and that's sometimes harder to evaluate. Um, but we see, you know, in the world of venture, it's sort of our job to evaluate what we think these big trends will be over time. Um, the second thing that we evaluate is product. Um, what problem are you solving? Are you solving an acute pain point? Um, you know, I think here I spend a lot of time thinking about is this a technology or is it a product? Um, the way that I think about the difference is a product is something that someone will pay for and a technology is something that's like really, really cool. And um, this is not a formal definition, just as how I think about it as a former product manager. Um, and then sort of the next evolution of that is a business. Um, not all things can and should progress from technology to product to business. Uh, and there's well understood playbooks for turning some technologies to products to businesses. Uh, in open source, for example, Again, back to databases, there's a very well understood playbook for how you turn an open source database project into a product um, or a service uh, that people will pay for because it turns out it's really hard to run databases and sometimes people want you to do it for them. Uh, and then the third, how do you turn that into an efficient business? So these are sort of the three evolutions of things that we see when you're building a business. The third thing and most important thing that we evaluate is the team. Um, the team, is this the right group of people to build this product? Do they have domain expertise? Uh, do they have a unique insight where they're building from first principles or experiences that they had in a prior company? So many times companies will actually pivot the product or idea they're working on, but the team is the thing that's always constant. Um, so I think team for me at the earliest stages is kind of the most important thing um, to bet on. There's a lot of really well-known companies that started uh, somewhere else, very different from where they landed. Um, I think Slack is actually a pretty interesting example because it started actually as a gaming communication tool and then now evolved into a complete enterprise uh, chat, chat uh, tool. Um, I know there's a lot of game developers in this room. I think game development is very cool because there's a lot of enterprise technologies that actually originate in gaming and eventually make their way to a broader audience. So I think gaming is very interesting because it pushes the boundaries with everything. Um, this is a really fun analogy that I made because I like kiteboarding. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have it in Vancouver. I felt a little wind, so um, maybe someone's doing it somewhere. Um, but even the best rider, uh, which in this case would be the team, with the best gear, which you can uh, say it could be the product, cannot kite without wind, the market. Um, the reason I love kiteboarding is that like there's so many things actually out of your control, which is very much like building a company. Um, you can come as prepared as possible, do all your research, um, look at the forecast, have the best plan, but things happen um, that are out of your control. Um, so it's good to have a prepared mind, um, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that are out of your control. And I think that's important, not just for building a business and for investing, but really life. Um, so uh, I think there's an element of luck that happens when you're building a company. 
um, that I think we all kind of forget. Um, you know, we look at the people that have succeeded in what they're doing and then get, they must have done everything right to get there. But the reality is there's an intersection of preparation and luck that gets anyone to where they are. Um, and that's why I like sports that have an element um, that's out of my control, like weather. Um, wind is pretty, cra pretty crazy. Surfing is cool too. I actually saw a lot of that here. Um, so another thing that I wanted to talk about today was at Amplify how we think about finding new areas to invest in. Um, there's two ways that we like to think about investing, which is like thematic or thesis driven. I think this is actually one of the most fun things about venture. Venture is very different from any other role I've had because there's so many different ways to do it. There's so many different ways that you can find really cool companies or um, figure out the next thing that you think um, could be a great business um, or a new product that you think should exist that developers want to have. Um, but you know, ultimately what I think is most fun is thinking about this future looking. So, a thematic, thematic investing would be looking at different categories like cloud infrastructure or fintech and game development, um, perhaps doing a deep dive in those areas and figuring out um, you know, what you think is happening there. Um, Thesis-driven investing is where you actually have a thesis of where something is going and you search for people building that. Um, I kind of believe that like, uh, the theses come from the founders, um, not the investors. Um, so I kind of prefer thematic intersecting with thesis driven. Um, I think we're all fooling ourselves if we know exactly where the puck is going. Don't they play like uh, hockey in Canada? Okay, I, I don't, I'm not good at sports analogies. So um, where the puck is going, yeah. Okay, so no one knows where the puck is going. Um, so I think we're fooling ourselves a little bit to think that we can actually predict the future. So I really like to get out there and talk to smart people, come to conferences like this to learn what you guys are using, what's cool. I found out about Zig at like a conference that Jamie Brandon put on called Hydrat Boy. I still think it's like the coolest name ever and I love to say it. Have you tried rubbing a database on it? Um, this is where I first found out about Tiger Beetle and Zig, um, and I love kind of finding these next waves of technologies that aren't really well known yet. Um, and I really love, um, you know, I loved all the talks yesterday because that got me really energized about these new things that might be coming uh, on the horizon for folks. <laughs> so um, I wanted to share some of the current exciting themes or theses that I'm thinking about right now. Um, so the first is verticalized infrastructure. Um, the big, so, so one of the beliefs that I've had or one of the things I've been seeing is that infrastructure is becoming more verticalized right now. The cloud gave us really good general primitives, I think, to build applications. Um, but I think what companies are starting to realize is to get um, more performance and cost optimization from the cloud, people are tending to specialize more. Um, I actually think Tiger Beetle is a great example of this, a database specialized for FinTech applications. So bringing the logic of double entry accounting into the database layer is pretty cool. I think this is also happening in the gaming space. I've seen a lot of cool game, uh, gaming specific developer tools out there and that are specifically targeted for the use cases and workflows of game developers. Um, so verticalized infrastructure is an area I'm really interested in. And then in particular, FinTech and gaming are two that I'm seeing a lot of really cool creative tools in. Um, the second theme or thesis that I'm excited about is that this idea of the decomposition of the database stack. Um, so something I'm seeing more and more of is sort of this ripping apart of the storage from the compute or execution engine. Um, so Snowflake sort of famously, but not first, um, did the separation of storage and compute in their architecture to allow you to scale those components separately. But now what I'm starting to see is that's happening at the vendor level. So now we have things like Apache Iceberg or Apache Hootie, which are like these table formats that are really uh, focused on like the bottom half of the database. And then you have projects like Velox out of Meta um, or like DuckDB, these execution engines that can run on different storage formats. So I think this is really interesting because of the third uh, theme that I have up here, which is the convergence of the, the machine learning and data stacks. So the other thing that I've seen is that depending on the user in your organization, people are using like very different tool chains, but they kind of all do the same thing. You have like Snowflake and Databricks, and I'm like, you're kind of storing the same data, but you're retrieving it differently. 
you either like SQL or you like Python, and your tool chain differs depending on how you like to retrieve and analyze the data. But what happens in, is or in an organization is that you have the same data duplicated not only twice, but like three times or four times, and this is like very, very expensive for organizations. So what if you could store the data once, but retrieve it in your preferred method? This is why I think the decomposition of the database stack is quite interesting. Um, so again, this is like, a theory, but it's also supported by some trends I'm seeing and some technologies, and it's something I think that's cool. So if you're working on this, or if you have ideas about this, or you think it's complete BS, also tell me that. Um, the fourth thing is moving code and compute to the data. Um, so another thing that I think is happening kind of across all industries is like that code is moving closer to the data and compute is moving to the edge. Um, this will help us you know, build better user experiences, new interactive applications. Um, I'm gonna use uh, an example again from Tiger Beetle, but they're bringing application logic and business logic closer to the database, um, which I think is very interesting. Instead of taking vanilla Postgres and building all your Java like application logic around it, hundreds of lines of cones, uh, hundreds of lines of code to do um, double entry accounting, like it's already in the database. I think that's super cool and that's a huge efficiency gain um, for companies. So the specialization um, in moving uh, code or compute to data, I think is really, really cool. The fifth area that I think is awesome is observability just in general is one of my favorite areas. I think making an opaque system like software observable is very, very difficult. Um, the whole concept of observability comes from control systems, comes from the physical world. If you wanted to know if something was, you know, something was happening in your system, smoke would be coming out of it. But now with software, we have logs and we have digital exhaust. And it's like really hard to figure out when something's going wrong. So I think um, tools that help you introspect or debug um, systems are like one of the coolest things out there, but I think they're really hard. Um, so I just think there's a lot of room for observability to get better. Um, I think there's really cool stuff happening within like the simulation world. Companies like Antithesis that are doing software simulation, deterministic simulation testing. Um, I think like taking these concepts that typically started in the physical world and applying them to software are really cool. Um, so that's the fifth theme that I think is really exciting. Um, next, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, specific companies that we've invested in, how they originated, uh, and I'm gonna break this up into two segments. One is academic projects, and the second is open source. So um, going back to this portfolio here, um, I've highlighted uh, one, two, three, four, five, six companies here that actually originated somehow in academia, whether that was like a white paper or a research project or a PhD program that someone did uh, research that they wanted to commercialize and turn into a company and was successful in doing so. Uh, any scale, uh, let's see. Oh shoot, this is really difficult here. Okay, so here's, um, here's a table that shows like the company name, uh, the research paper that the you know, students or founders wrote, and then kind of the timeline uh, that happened here. So there's usually about two or three years between when someone does research and is able to kind of effectively um, turn that into a business. You'll notice that Runway is unusual because the paper was published three years later. Um, so they created Stable Diffusion. There's another company, Stability AI, that also uses that research. Um, they published it after they formed the company, but the research was um, underway for many years before that. Um, Mother Duck is a cool one to call out because Whereas all of the creators and researchers of these projects now work at those companies, um, Mother Duck is actually building around an open source database called DuckDB. And DuckDB originated out of CWI, which is a university in the Netherlands. And they have a nonprofit organization over there called DuckDB Labs, which is in charge of uh, the, the DuckDB project. Um, Mother Duck is a company that is venture backed, that is um, building a serverless 
uh, product around DuckDB, but DuckDB Labs still exists and has a partnership with Mother Duck. Um, DuckDB Labs didn't want to take venture funding. Um, they wanted to remain independent. And so what was really cool about this situation is that actually uh, they, they papered up an arrangement so that DuckDB Labs can actually still have equity in Mother Duck, um, but can remain independent and continue the nonprofit. But there also is a company that is now venture backed that's working on the technology. That's a pretty unusual situation. I actually do hope we see more of that where um, like the nonprofit organizations that are helping, uh, you know, or that are contributing a lot of the technology can still benefit in the upside um, that some of these startups might generate. Um, now going on to open source. Same slide, uh, like 65, 70% of the companies that we've invested in have an open source component to them. Um, Open source is not a silver bullet. It's actually very hard to make money from something that's free. So um, I think people have this like misconception because open source is so popular that like if you just open source it, like there's a path to commercialization or there's a path to making money somewhere down the line. This is like absolutely not true. And it's very hard to make money off of open source, off of something that's free. For all the companies that are up here that you've heard of, um, that have successfully found ways to do that, I guarantee you there are hundreds more you've never heard of that never found a way to make money. So I just want to put that out there. Open source is not a silver bullet, neither is closed source. Um, of the database companies that I've worked at, uh, they've all been closed source databases. Uh, and I was always competing against like the open source. So I, when I was working on Cloud Firestore at Google, our biggest competitor was MongoDB. Um, so it's really interesting because you can have two different products solving the same need. One is using an open source business model and one is doing closed source. And I'm telling you, there's no silver bullet. Um, so if you think just open sourcing your project is the way um, to start a business, that is not correct. There are so many more pieces to the puzzle. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you build a business around something that's free? That's kind of the big question here. Um, I alluded to this, but there are some playbooks that have worked really well for certain types of open source projects. Um, there are three primary ways um, that you can make money from an open source project. The first is by providing um, supports and support and services around it. Um, this is something that's kind of harder to do, I would say, and not as scalable. It's why I could only find one example um, of companies that do this. Um, and what's also interesting is Red Hat, as far as I know, is like the only company that successfully commercialized an operating system. And they did that just by services and like people consulting and helping you uh, do that. Um, then we have the open core model. Um, the open core model is where you have a paid version with enhanced features and enterprise features. Um, this is becoming more common. And then you have SaaS where you're actually hosting the product. Um, many companies might have multiple of these options. Um, so you'll have the open source project. Um, you might have a SaaS hosted version of it. And you also might have an open core version. Um, there's sort of many different combinations that you can have of this. Um, one thing I will say is that like, I think the reason that open source business models work is that open source software is hard to run. If it wasn't hard to run, Node would make money from hosting it. So I wonder if open source software was like super easy to use, if we'd even have businesses around it. I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, that's like a hot take. I have no idea. But um, I do think that open source software and software in general is hard to run, which is why people will pay other people to run it for them. Uh, okay, um, open source licensing models. So I think this is really interesting to talk about um, because I looked at the data and I compared the open source licensing models from 2022 to 2021, and I saw that over time, things were getting more permissive. And this was surprising to me because of the stuff that's been happening with AWS and you know, the big organizations that are super open source friendly that build, or <laughs> build services around the open source. Uh, that was a joke. Um, so um, yeah, I, I was surprised to see that 
the number of licenses for open source is getting more permissive. But the reason I think that must be is that just more people are building an open source and probably it's easier to get started with a permissive license. So what this is not showing is like probably the proportion of ones that are being commercialized, what are those licenses? Um, there's like a bunch of companies that have had to change their licenses um, to keep Amazon and other organizations from uh, you know, making money off of those services um, without that company making money. So um, I, I, I think the trend was that overall things were becoming more permissive, but my experience was the opposite. So this, I was scratching my head a little bit, but I thought it was important to put this up here. Um, does open source always succeed? Absolutely not. Um, it's also like super rare that the companies that we're evaluating <laughs> have revenue. So it's like super cool when we actually see uh, a startup that has figured out a way to make money. This is like the hardest thing about building a business, especially around open source, is you're giving something away for free and then you're trying to ask people for money. Like that's super hard to do and usually doesn't work. Um, so I wanted to give a little quick story, um, the tale of two projects, um, Kafka and Docker. Um, the reason that I wanted to highlight these two companies is because they're both venture backed, they both have an open source component, but they both had very, very different outcomes. Uh, and I think there's a lot of ways uh, we could analyze why one quote worked and one didn't. But I think the most important takeaway that I had from this was like the sequencing of open source and commercialization and also how the company approached community building. I think the biggest failure mode for open source companies is actually not thinking about their community well and trying to commercialize or like kind of extract value from the community um, and, and break trust along the way. And I think this is what happened with Docker. And it, I think this is something that Kafka did really well. Um, so uh, the company around Kafka is called Confluent. Um, Docker, I guess, started their open source project uh, more closely to when they were commercializing, almost like around the same time. Whereas Kafka was an open source project that existed for many years within LinkedIn and had a very big community before they went about trying to uh, build a service around it. Again, um, I think that both companies exist because open source software is hard to run. And so um, they found a way to get people to pay them uh, to host it. But I think ultimately the takeaway for me was that um, Building trust and keeping trust within your community is one of the most important things for building an open source business. And I think that's one of the biggest failure modes for companies that try to commercialize too quickly is that you lose um, the trust of your community. Uh, so building software you can love, I wanted to apply a psychological theory here, which is Maslow's hierarchy of developer needs. Um, so we're going to start at the bottom, the most fundamental needs at the bottom, and then make our way up to self-actualization and transcendence at the top. I think Zig has probably already made it, um, which is why we're all here in Vancouver and had some awesome talks yesterday. Um, but I think at the bottom, when you're kind of evaluating what stage your product is at, or even if you're a builder and you're trying to see like what stage is my technology at, I think this is kind of a cool way to think about it. Number one, are you solving an acute pain point? Uh, maybe your like cron job or script that's sitting on your laptop falls into this category. It made something like quicker for you that was painful, um, but maybe you don't love it. Maybe you don't feel nice and fuzzy when you use it, but like it solves a pain point. Um, so the next level up would be, um, do I trust this product with my workflow and application or maybe my career? Am I going to choose to kind of bring this technology into an organization that I work at? Um, do I love it? Uh, myself. Uh, the third and highest level of act actualization is, um, do I love this product? Do I want to tell my coworkers about it? Do I want to share it? Um, and do I feel like I'm part of something bigger? And I think um, when a, an open source uh, community thrives, um, you do feel like you're part of something bigger. Um, and I think that uh, that's where everyone that's building an open source product or uh, company strives to be at. The second framework that I like to play with for software you can love is winning the hearts and minds framework. So we um, coach a lot of the companies that we work with um, on uh, this framework, which is basically all the elements of curating your community, but also fostering it to make sure um, that you are following the right set of 
uh, steps and paths to make sure the community thrives uh, and doesn't fall apart. Um, so the first step is winning minds. Are you solving a real problem? Um, do you have engineering excellence? Um, are you building something that's 10 times better? The second thing is around winning hearts. Um, have you built trust within the community? Um, are you putting on events, partnerships? Um, and then kind of what's the personality of your ecosystem? Is it one where people feel um, you know, loved or is it one where people feel a lot of animosity? I think these are all kind of important things and attributes of the community. Um, and the third is capturing love have your fans turned into champions. Um, ultimately, this becomes a flywheel. If you built a good community, you kind of don't have to think about it. Um, so open source strategy key learnings from working with some of these open source companies. Number one, always make sure you're solving an acute problem. Um, number two, become a standard. And number three, trust is sacred. Um, I'm going to move through three case studies really quickly. Um, I'm being a little cognizant of time since I know it's lunch. Um, I'm going to talk to you about three companies that I work with that I'm really excited about. Um, so ReadySet uh, is building a SQL caching engine that sits on top of your existing database. They are solving a very acute problem for people, which is writing custom caching logic. Um, there are systems like Redis that exist which can be expensive um, and other problems too. Um, but ultimately, um, making sure you're solving an acute problem is very, very important. Um, Ready Set is cool because they are also doing the move the code to data thing. So they are uh, making sure that data can be retrieved faster kind of at the edge and building a universal data plane. So I'm really excited about what they're doing. Um, the second company is Tiger Beetle, which many of us are familiar with here. Um, they are building a hyper-fast transactional database for accounting use cases. Um, this aligned really well with a thesis that we've been exploring, this theme around verticalized infrastructure. Um, and we saw that they were solving this acute pain point for fintech developers and uh, people building applications that needed high durability um, that were also doing transactions. Um, it was kind of uncanny to talk to developers developers in this space and hear that this was one of the hardest things that they ever had to build within their company, a ledger database. They would often be taking kind of a vanilla database, a vanilla transactional database, and wrapping that with tons of logic that was very custom um, to make it durable, to make it work with transactions and payments. The fact that Tiger Beetle is doing this out of the box is really, really cool. Even more exciting is that they're using Zig to do this. Uh, and the final company that I wanted to highlight that is also really cool, also a database, is MotherDuck, which I talked about a little bit in the academic project section. Um, MotherDuck is building a serverless data platform around DuckDB. Um, I think, you know, with their... Uh, their angle is very interesting because there was sort of this explosion of big data and like bigger databases and more distributed nodes. And they sort of flipped it on its head and they're like, oh, I mean, a single node database kind of works well if you just scale it up. Like, let's stop scaling out. Things get harder when you have a lot of nodes. Um, so it turns out, um, you know, a lot of the folks that are working at MotherDuck actually uh, worked on the BigQuery team at Google and observed that the majority of people using BigQuery were actually running it on fairly small data sets. Um, so we like to tout the power of these systems for big data, but a lot of people have smaller data sets and uh, you kind of just don't need the overkill of these huge data warehouses um, to do your analytical use cases. So they're trying to make um, kind of the power of DuckDB more accessible for everyone. Um, I think it's really cool and I'm really excited. Um, so now I want to wrap it up with some of my takeaways from working in venture capital. Um, I think the top thing is that venture capital can be an efficient way to scale an idea, but it's certainly not the right model for all businesses. Um, there are many ways to build companies. Some people also don't have the aspiration or desire to build a company. Maybe you want this to just be your project and, and that's a way as well. Um, so what I wanted to highlight is sort of like having stepped behind the curtain, what I learned is that there are things that venture capital capital is good for. There are also things that it's just not a match for. Um, I think the second thing is that to build a successful company, if that is your aspiration, um, it has to be the right intersection of many things. You have to be solving an acute problem. You also have to be creating something that people will ultimately want to pay for. Uh, and you have to make sure that you you know, are building a product, not a technology in search of a problem. Um, I was at a company that fell into this probably this failure failure mode. Um, so I have a lot of learnings from that. Um, and it's why I really appreciate, um, you know, 
I, I really appreciate the discipline of product management because it's how you take a technology and turn it into something that can be maybe consumed more generally. The third is that team, product, and market are all really important when evaluating uh, companies at the investment stage. I think team is the most important, and so that's what I like to focus on at early stages. And that's it. So if you guys have questions, happy to take them. So unfortunately, we are uh, short on uh, QA time. So same thing, uh, I would, you know, we've got lunch, so ask Natalie the, your questions then. Um, I'll make one comment. I like that you threw CMD in there. Um, <laughs> I did switch that from system to system. Yeah, no, I, no, I noticed that. Uh, and this, also, uh, this is the second time I've watched that talk, and I worked at CMD uh, when it was acquired. Uh, so, but I did not know, like, Amplify Partners was an investor, so I think that uh, very much supports your um, idea that uh, funding's usually quite opaque. Okay. Um, hi, Natalie. Hello. I know that you worked in, now you're doing venture capital, but you used to work in tech more directly, right, before. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I worked uh, in databases and distributed systems for about 10 years before moving to the investing side. Started as a systems engineer, moved to product management, uh, and... Uh, I, you know, I mean, I guess the common thread was the type of technologies that I worked on, uh, and then only joined the investing side about two and a half years ago. Awesome, thank you. So you said uh, engineering, product management, uh, investment. Uh, so you've seen a few different places. Uh, here's one question for you. What is one thing that people that work in tech, like programmers, really don't get that it's very obvious for people doing other jobs? Do you have any? Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's something that you mentioned in your talk, which is it's really important to expand the disciplines that you know about. So I have seen the same problem from three different angles now. Um, I've been working in databases the whole time, but seeing it first from the system side, building it, second from the product side, where you're thinking about strategy and roadmap, and then third from the investing side. So I think the most important thing is just to make sure that you have a well-rounded view of the problem that you're solving. Um, it'll only make you better at being a programmer. Right.